tied up here in the ninth. Two and two is the count. Two outs and a man on third. The pressure is on for these young men. They've all worked so hard for this moment. One run is all they need to win it all. Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Good, good. Does anybody know what this is? It is not a lightsaber, just uh, so you know. But the force is strong with it. Um, how about now? What? Selfie stick. Thank you, thank you. All right. Let me show you. We need to capture this moment this morning, so uh, I'm going to hook this thing up here, if I can. I'm, I'm excellent with technology. What? Okay. All right. Now, I did this with the first service. I did this with the first service, and uh, so we can scientifically prove which... Which group of worshipers is uh, is better looking? <laughs> so, are you ready? There we go. Let's get another one. There you go. I think the glare off the top of my head probably messed that up. But. So that's a selfie stick. And uh, in case you... Uh, uh, I'd never seen one before. They're very prominent. If you go anywhere on vacation, you'll see a bunch of families with these. You'll see them take. Oh, that's the, that's the push button. Uh, it won't work without that. Like I said, I'm excellent with these things. You'll see them. Uh, and uh, kids have them. And uh, they, you know, they're always taking selfies. Selfies are, are kind of a. Uh, Everywhere, right? I mean, you see a new selfie every day. You turn on your uh, your phone, your computer. You look on the Facebook. You see all those things. Uh, I think someday, so what? Like maybe 500 years in the future, when they are examining the ruins of our civilization, they're going to dig that up, and they're going to say, "That's where it happened. That's where the wheels came off." That's when it stopped being the United States of America and became the United States of Kardashian. <laughs> you know, selfies at their worst, they can be uh, very narcissistic, you know. I mean, what can be more self-centered than a selfie, right? We are taking those things. And we can, we can get really silly with them. Like, look at this, this picture here. There you go. It's a typical selfie. I was at a uh, music festival uh, back in September, and I was, I was laughing. I was with my friend Doug, and he said, what are you laughing at? And I said, there's a couple of girls down here, and they have been taking selfies of themselves uh, together and posing and getting, their, you know, getting their duck lips just right, you know, and everything. <laughs> uh, for, I said, for 10 minutes, they've been, they've been taking nonstop pictures of themselves, and that's what it is. And, and what is the thing with duck lips? Anybody want to enlighten me about that? What's, what's the deal with that? Make their lips look bigger? Uh, okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> <Did that. laughs> I, I guess you look more attractive that way, especially if you're trying to attract ducks. That would, that would work, you know. Uh, so I said, at, the, at their worst, selfies can be very uh, narcissistic, self-centered, uh, that kind of thing. But they also can be very special. They, we use a selfie in order to capture a moment, to really get to 
capture something that, that we don't want to forget about, that we want to be able to look back on it and remember. Uh, we all want that perfect Kodak moment. Do you remember? You might remember Kodak. <laughs> you used to have to put film in a camera, take a picture, and then wait a couple weeks to see what it looks like. <laughs> kind of takes the fun out of selfies right there. Uh, but um, we all wanted that Kodak moment. I even remember a, a, a Kodak commercial that had this little song in it that said, do you remember the times of your life? And uh, that ca- capturing the right photograph of the right event at the right time could go with you for years to come to remember something special, to remember a moment. So selfies can not only, on the bad side, they can be very self-centered, but you can also capture things that are very precious. Look at this. There. Now that's my daughter. That's my daughter Bethany with Harper when she was just a little one. And she caught that with a selfie. I like that one. <laughs> um, or you can capture really silly times too, like this. <laughs> oh, we work so hard at the office. <laughs> oh. And uh, don't you miss Kathy? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> but the re- oh boy, I'm gonna get it. But the but the real reason that we take these selfies and remember these moments uh, is because we know that without them, we're more likely to forget. We know we're going to forget them, so why don't we take, take a picture, take a selfie, and, and it will help us. So, welcome to church this morning. We're continuing our series, The Bottom of the Ninth. You know, what did we learn last week? We learned that we have to step up to the plate. When it gets tough in the bottom of the ninth, we need to step up to the plate. If you were paying attention last week, you also learned that if you score 10 runs in the first inning, you don't have to worry about the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Today's message, though, is uh, kind of fits that theme because the idea that it, that this today is not just for people who are in the bottom of the ninth, in those bottom of the ninth situations. Today's message really is uh, to help people, all of us, prepare for the bottom of the ninth, to get ready for the bottom of the ninth before the bottom of the ninth actually comes. And God commanded His people. To do this, we all have two kinds of moments in our lives. Among all the other moments we have, we have moments of darkness. We have moments in the dark. These dark moments that we can't see how it's going to end. And it's quite frightening to be in those moments because we're not sure what the ending is going to be. Most people's faith is stretched and tested when the situation is dark. You know what I'm talking about. You've been through those dark moments. And then we have these moments of light. We have these moments where we, you know, you remember, you prayed and you prayed and you prayed, and then God came through. He answered your prayer. He did the thing that you were asking him to do. Something good came your way when you, were, when you were so needy and wanting and you prayed and God kept his promises to you. When you have those moments of light, here's a question. How could you ever forget those moments? How could you ever forget those moments of light? You know, those times when you say, I thought I'd never get this job, but I got it. God is so faithful. I thought I'd never meet someone, but through a bizarre circumstance, I did. God is so faithful. Some might say, there was a time I thought that we were, we were never going to be able to get pregnant and have, and have a baby. But God came through. God, you are so faithful. I've heard stories, testimonies here from several of you who have foster children and are working with adoption and and there's times that you're just not sure what's going to happen but God came through 
and provided. God is so faithful. When those things happen, how could you ever forget those times of God's faithfulness? How could you forgive those moments of light when God came through on his promises? Well, why is it important then that today we're going to talk about remembering? You see, God knows our tendency to doubt in the dark what we've learned in the light. He knows that we have a tendency to doubt in the dark what we've learned in the light. Too often, we forget the faithfulness of God and remember when God didn't move in the way we, deserve, we, we desired. We can sometimes, if we're not careful, we take credit for his faithfulness and blame him for our failures. When we fail to remember his faithfulness in the light, we're tempted to question God's faithfulness in the dark. We rarely remember what God did in the light, but we never forget what God didn't do in the dark. Let me say that again. We rarely remember what God did in the light, but we never forget what God didn't do in the dark. There are probably some of us here this morning, maybe, who are still struggling with bitterness over something that God didn't do. And yet, how quickly do we forget the good thing, the faithfulness that God did do in our lives? The light is the thing that brings hope to the dark when we choose to remember what happened in the light. It's your remembering of what God did in the light that will give you hope when you go through the dark. Are you hearing me? It's your memory of what God did in the light, his faithfulness in the light, that's meant to give you hope and help in the times when it gets dark again. The light can bring hope to the dark only when we choose to remember what happened in the light. God commands his people to do something in the light, and it's worth us paying attention to. In fact, there's a great story that we're going to talk about this morning about Joshua and the children of Israel and how God led them through the wilderness to the place where they were right at the edge of going into the promised land. The only thing that stood between them And the promised land was a river, the Jordan River. Joshua records the culmination of Israel's journey into the promised land. Now, this took place about 1400 B.C., that is 1400 years before Christ. And after 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, in the desert, before they got there to the river to cross. The ultimate promise of the book of Joshua is that God is the true and ultimate promise keeper. All the promises that God made all the way back to Abraham in the book of Genesis are now going to be fulfilled through Joshua and through the people of Israel as they prepare to go into the promised land. As faithful and present as God was with Israel... He is with us today. So let's look at Joshua chapter 3 and a little bit of chapter 4 and and talk about this great story. It's a really good one. They're standing there on the banks of the Jordan River. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites are there. Maybe millions. Maybe one or two million. Are standing there on the banks of the Jordan. And God says the promised land is over there across the river now understand that the Jordan is at flood stage at this time during the harvest they were going to cross sometime in April or May and this is at the time when the river is at its swiftest and its deepest and at its widest the way that this works when you think of the geography of Israel you have 
you have two great bodies of water. One is the Sea of Galilee, which is at the top, uh, at the north. And then in the south, you have the Dead Sea. And in between, you have the River Jordan that runs right between them from north to south. And they are fed by the snows on Mount Hermon. After the winter, when the snows start to melt, they come. the, the water runs down into the lake of Sea of Galilee and then down into the River Jordan. And in the springtime, that's when the river is deepest and it's at its widest. In fact, when the rainy season ends, the Jordan rises to a depth of 10 to 12 feet and it floods to a width of 300 to 350 feet. So if you can imagine... When we talk about the River Jordan, we're not talking about a creek that you can wade through. We're talking about the river at its, at its deepest point, 10 to 12 feet deep, 350, 300, 350 feet across, about the length of a football field. Okay? You got this picture in your mind? And God tells them to move forward. In fact, he, he tells them to do it in a certain way. He takes the priests of Israel, and on their shoulders, they carry the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, I, uh, I've got this little, someone gave me this, and it sits in my office. I seldom have use for it, except to remember the story. Uh, J.R., would you come up here? This is a, a picture of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, don't think Noah's Ark. That's a boat. That's another way to get across the river. But this is different. <laughs> the Ark is a box, a, a golden box. And uh, on the cover of it are two angels. And this was meant to represent for, for Israel the very point, the spot, the hot spot of God's presence was right between those two angels. So it represented God's presence. And the, it had poles that went through these rings on the side of it, and they carried it. The priest would carry it. I'm going to pass this around. JR's going to take it over there. Just pass it. It'll give you a, a, a more uh, 3D picture of what that looked like. So these priests, when God commands them to go forward, these priests step towards the water. And as soon as... They, their feet got wet. As soon as they stepped into the River Jordan, their feet touched the water's edge. Look, listen what happened. The water from upstream stopped flowing. In fact, in fact, it piled up in a heap at a great distance away in a town called Adam uh, in the vicinity of, of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that's the water flowing south into the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood and stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. Now, you getting the picture here? These priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They go to this mighty river, 10, 12 feet deep, 350 feet across, they put their feet into the water, and suddenly the river stops flowing. And the water to the south just keeps flowing until under the feet of the priest is dry ground. And the priests go out into the middle, and then this great crowd of Israelites walks across the Jordan River on dry ground. Are you getting that? That's an amazing miracle, isn't it? What an awesome thing. And what about these priests, too? Didn't that take a lot of faith to go up to that river, you know, and walk right into it, trusting that God's making a way for them to get into the promised land? And wow, the river stops flowing, and they walk across on dry ground. I think that's an amazing thing. What an amazing moment for Israel to get them into the promised land. 
The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. And while all of Israel passed by till the, till the whole nation completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, <laughs> what an amazing miracle that is. How in the world could Israel ever forget that story? How could they ever forget that event of walking across the Jordan on dry ground like that? How could they? Well, you know they could. <laughs> You know they could because their, an their ancestors before them had forgotten when they had a similar event, an even greater event. When God delivered them out of slavery in Egypt, when he said to Pharaoh, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no, no, no. And God begins to bring plagues upon them. The Nile River turns to blood, and then there's frogs, and there's flies, and there's gnats, and several other kinds of bugs. God really knew how to bug a Pharaoh. He used, he used real bugs, right? All these horrible plagues come, and then the firstborn of, of Egypt are slain, and the Israelites uh, spread the blood of the lamb over their doorpost, and the Passover happens, and then people are set free, and they leave Egypt and come to, not, not a river, but a sea, the Red Sea. And behind them are coming the chariots. Pharaoh's changed his mind again and decided to, to set the army loose on them. And they're trapped between the devil and the deep Red Sea. <laughs> between uh, Pharaoh and this Red Sea. And what does God do? Moses raises his staff and suddenly... The Red Sea parts, and again, the Israelites now walk across the Red Sea to freedom because of God's might. How long did it take Israel to forget about that? They did forget, didn't they? A few scenes later, just a few pages in your Bible, and they're, they're building a golden calf and sacrificing to a golden calf and saying, this is the God who brought us up out of Egypt. Are you kidding me? The sad truth is that we are entirely capable, like the Israelites, of seeing God do mighty works, doing wonderful things in our lives, and then later forgetting all about them. God did miracle after miracle for them. He uh, fed them manna in the desert, this stuff that looked like Bread fell on the ground, and they could gather it up and cook it and make bread out of it. They ate it for 40 years. He gave them water from a rock, and yet they still complained about all of that. So, God knows that, and he wants the Israelites to never forget this event that's taking place at the Jordan River. So he has them do something, and that's our lesson for today. Because we don't want to forget. We want to remember what God has done for us in the light. So in Joshua 4, verses 1 through 9, it says, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe. So how many tribes of Israel? Twelve. Choose twelve men, one from each tribe. And tell them to take 12 stones from where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay. Now, this is, uh, this is interesting. They, they obeyed this, but think about it. The whole nation has passed through the Jordan. They're on the other side. The priests are still standing in the middle of Jordan. God says, go back, choose 12 men and tell them to go back in there and get 12 stones. Now, the river has been backed up for a long time. I don't know about you, but I'd be starting to get nervous about going back in there. But they go back in. They pick up 12 stones. They take them to the other side, to the, to the side on the other side of the, of the Jordan River, and they stack them together there. They stack them together there. So Joshua got the 12 men, and he told them, Go over before the ark of the Lord in the middle of Jordan. Each of you take a stone on his shoulder 
according to the number of tribes of Israelites, and this is going to serve as a sign among you. So they stacked them up on the far side, on the far side of the Jordan where God had brought them across from, and it must have looked something like this. There's a stack of, of stones. Here we go. Next. There you go. So 12 stones stacked up there to remind them of this, to see it, a memorial, a reminder that these stones would be there, okay? Uh, there's a church down in uh, the Atlanta area. It's called 12 Stone Church. Now, they were a church, I think they were called Crossway Church, a small congregation for a long time, but God blessed them and gave them a vision that was so much greater than them. But as they followed God's direction and guidance, they began to see God fulfill that, so much so that they were able to purchase a great deal of property and begin, be, and begin to uh, be a church that didn't just serve the needs of their congregation, but began to have an impact over the whole city of Atlanta, the whole metro area, and plant churches in various places so that they're not just one central church, but the church has planted lots of places. They decided that this vision was so great and that God had been so faithful to them that they wanted to be able to be reminded every time they came to church what God had done. So what did they do? They changed their name. Now the name of the church is called now, to this day, is called Twelve Stone. And this is the entryway to the church. Right there. Twelve big old stones. Uh, you couldn't put those on your shoulder, I don't think, but those are right. It's in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, northeast Atlanta area. In fact, we had Jason Berry here a few years ago from 12 Stone, and he was here for a district event, and I think he spoke here on Sunday morning. But it's, a, it's an amazing church. They've had a huge effect, and because their pastor is a writer, uh, he's, been, uh, he's been able to be used uh, around the country to uh, talk about how churches can have great vision and see God do amazing things. I've been to the church. My sister-in-law and brother-in-law uh, go there, and I've driven by those stones, and pretty impressive, you know. You can't help but look at it and say, wow, what's that about? Check that out. It became for them what it was for Israel, the 12 stones on the other side of the Jordan. This is a reminder to them what God did, that this church is not just here because there's some smart people <laughs> who can build buildings and and buy property and do some things. This is something God did. This is something God did. So God says with these 12 stones, he wants them to know that in the future, your children are going to ask you, what do these stones mean? And I love that because you know what's going to happen, right? You know a child is going to say, what's that? You know, my, uh, my granddaughter Harper, one of the first things she learned to say was, what's that? And for a while, that was almost like the only thing she'd say. She'd just go into a room and start pointing and saying, What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? You know? Your children are naturally inquisitive. And they ask questions like that. But the wisdom of God in this is that not only was this generation who walked on the dry ground across, uh, past the Ark of the Covenant, across the Jordan, not only were they going to get the benefit of seeing this, but because of the stones, the next generation would one day ask, what's that? And they would tell the story. These 12 stones came from the middle of the Jordan River. <laughs> I thought about this. It's funny when I think about it. How else do you... <laughs> How else do you get stoned from the middle of a river to the other side of the river unless something happens to make it dry ground? It's not like you can swim out there. Even scuba divers couldn't carry stones, right? You couldn't go into the middle of a full flowing river and get stoned from the bottom and, and get them over to the, to the other side. But because God did this miracle, because God made dry ground, men were able to go in there, take those stones, pull them out of the center of that river, 
which normally would have been covered by 10 to 12 feet of water, and bring it to the side and stack them up as a reminder to God. And every time a child said, what's that? What is this? They could be told that story and it would get passed on to remember. So God wants the children of Israel, wants the people of Israel to not only remember what he did, but to pass it on to the next generation. And God wants to take the good things that he's done in your life in the light. And when it's dark, he wants to inspire and encourage you with a reminder of what he did. And he wants it to be lived out with such grace, amazing grace, that, that, that the kids could look at what's going on in your life and say, what's that? What is that? And you get to tell the stories to the children. Well, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. They were going to forget. God knew they were going to forget. And so he wanted them to remember. And they did what Joshua, what God commanded Joshua. And those stones were there, at least up until the time of this writing, they were still there. They did it. And they had the response. Here's the application of what we're talking about today. What will you do to remember what God has done for you in the light so that when the dark comes, you'll be able to remember. Remember what you saw in the light so you don't forget it in the dark. We have to recognize that it's God's faithfulness that allows us to enjoy the light. And that way, when the dark times come, we're not lost in total darkness. The light that we have, our memory becomes a light in our darkness because we know what God did there in the light, it brings us hope into the midst of our darkness. So, remembering what God did for you in the light provides hope when you find yourself in the dark. But if we're honest with ourselves, just as the people of Israel were, you won't always remember. It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to rationalize and explain things. It's so easy to eventually even take credit for what God did. We have a way of forgetting. So here's an, here's a, here's an idea. Why don't we stack some rocks in our life to remind us what God did? Why don't we do something that would cause us to remember some great thing that God did in our life? Why don't we memorialize God's work in our life? How do you do that? Well, one way is you get your selfie stick out and you take a picture in that hospital room. Ah. Uh, you write something. You have a song that you connect with the work of God at that time in your life. And every time you hear that song, you remember it. You have some object or something that was involved in that. And, and it may seem strange, but you put it on, a, on your desk at work or you put it on a shelf in your home. Something to remind you what God did there. And when, you're, when your children look at it and say, Dad, what's that? Then you tell your story. <laughs> you tell your story. Uh, you take things like that and you, you let them become memorials of what God did in the light. And they will bring God's light into the dark times which are bound to come again. Something to help you not forget but to remember. It could be a Bible verse. It could be a place where something happened. It could be a person that you always associate with what God did in your life at that point. It could be an item, an object. It could be a journal. Some people get a lot 
remember a lot because they write down at the end of every day something about what God did. A song, like I said, it could be a box that you keep these memorials in. You know, I've got a few things like this in my office. I've got some things like that. I know uh, God's provided for us in a lot of ways, and I remember those things whenever I touch them. Find those memorials and let them be a reminder to you of what God has done. Because you'll find that the dark is not so dark when you have memorials of the light. Amen.